Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker, and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is fake pharma education, doctors, and UAWs, or under accumulators of wealth. So, what in the world is going on here? So, Novartis, which is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the country, just performed a settlement with the federal government of the United States for $678 million for activities by their sales representatives between 2002 and 2011, where, like many drug companies, Novartis had speaker programs and fancy dinners where they would wine and dine physicians and they would have a physician speaker who was paid under the guise of some sort of like educational event. But there was very little to no education going on and this was just what essentially amounted to almost like bribery in giving these doctors these very nice dinners and these speaking opportunities in exchange for prescribing a lot of Novartis medications. So that was fraud. So they got caught by the feds. They had to pay the settlement. Now, it got so bad that sometimes these events didn't even occur. So there was one, I'll leave a link in the show notes to the story. There was one example where the Novartis representative created fake receipts from a restaurant and just paid the speaker for not even speaking at all. The event didn't even happen. So this is, by the way, the third largest pharmaceutical co uh, company in the world. And I say this to be like, look, this is like the most mainstream of the mainstream. This is not some fringe pharmaceutical company. I mean, this is one of the biggest and one of the oldest, okay? They do 47 billion a year in revenue. Their three blockbuster drugs are Cosentix, which is for psoriasis, Galenia, which is for multiple sclerosis, and Lucentis, which is for uh, diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration. So. This gets me thinking, okay, so Novartis gets in trouble. What about all the physicians who were going to the fancy dinners and being paid as speakers? They knew what was going on. They didn't have any recourse at all. They didn't get in trouble. But what does this say about the physician mentality when it comes to money? And so this does not describe all physicians. It doesn't even necessarily describe a majority of physicians. But it probably describes a significant minority, let's say 20 to 30 percent of physicians, in my experience, in terms of how they think about money. It's a little screwy, okay? So, you got to remember that physicians make a ton of money, right? Quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars a year. However, when they were in high school and in college, a lot of their friends, because you know a lot of physicians are hardworking, very intelligent people. They had a lot of hardworking, very intelligent friends that went on to become powerful corporate attorneys. They went on to Wall Street, investment banks, hedge funds, businesses, and they, their friends, stay and started making a ton of money in their 20s and 30s. Meanwhile, physicians remain poor in their 20s and 30s because they've got, they're going to medical school and they're doing residency and it's not just into their 20s, it's well into their 30s, especially if they do a fellowship after their residency. So they get this sense of like relative deprivation where they see all of their quote unquote peers in non-medical professions that are making all this money and these houses and these vacations and they're sitting here in this dumpy apartment in this used car, not, not able to start a family a lot of the time. So I'm not asking anybody to feel sorry for physicians, but it does something screwy to their mentality um, so that when they do get out of their fellowship or their residency and they start getting a big check, then not only do they have debt, but they just start to spend, spend, spend. And that gets me to the final point, which is the book The Millionaire Next Door from the 1990s. Many of you have probably read this book where they talk about under accumulators of wealth. In other words, people that make a ton of money, but they just don't have a lot of wealth because they spend it all. And what is the A number one example that they give in the millionaire next door for the prototypical under accumulator of wealth? It's doctors. That's exactly right. And you know, and so they always, you know, physicians oftentimes will hide behind, oh, you know, it's all this medical school debt. And go, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to downplay that. But a lot of them too are Spend, spend, spend. I mean, one of the doctors at the hospital I worked, he drove a Bentley. I'm not sure he needed to drive a Bentley, okay? So now, when it comes to the actual, let's just say, fraudulent whining and dining uh, under the guise of medical education, it's hard, right? Because regulation uh, for physicians is done at the state level. It's not done at the federal level. So 
each state medical board kind of has its own way of dealing with these things. Okay, next, so it's highly balkanized. Next, open payments, which was started by CMS after the Affordable Care Act was passed, that actually displays the so, so pharmaceutical companies have to log how much money they're giving to physicians by name. And you can go to openpayments.cms.gov and you can actually look up, type it, you can type in my name, you can type in any doctor's name, and you can see how much money they've been receiving from pharmaceutical companies. So that's relatively recent, 2013, right? This has been going on for decades. So it's just important to know that when physicians are making decisions, and when pharmaceutical companies are marketing their products, that there is a mentality within a significant minority of physicians that allows them to be, you know, arguably corrupted by the sales techniques of some pharmaceutical companies. And that's my point for today. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Z.